This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Valeria Tellez interviews Jules Price, the author of Don't Eat the Scraps and other powerful Jules rules for success in any new relationship. Don't Eat the Scraps describes the crucial and, as of now, unknown theory of a behavior that men exhibit in the first six to eight weeks in dating. Women everywhere find themselves scratching their head, asking themselves the chin-quivering question, where did it all go wrong? In a light-hearted, provocative, and hilarious way, Jules lays out all the things that women need to know in order to navigate step-by-step through the first months of any relationship, armed with some of the soundest Jules Rules dating advice they'll ever receive to overcome future hurdles and scraps. It is a one-stop guide to thriving in the murky waters of the dating world and have a few out loud chuckles along the way. Jules Price is originally from outside of Washington, D.C. and then lived in New York City for 14 years, performing professionally in Broadway musicals and operettas. She currently still performs with the New York City Ballet as a principal singer in their West Side Story Suites repertoire. Jules relocated to Sarasota, Florida with her husband, Jeremy, whom she met on Match.com and became one of the top reps for a worldwide online greeting card and gift company. This business opened up an unexpected worldwide platform for her to voice her down-to-earth, relatable advice. She published her first book in 2010 to help people with relationships in business, and now her second book just came out, which is a humorous book for women only about dating and relationships called Don't Eat the Scraps. She is also a professional voiceover artist from her home studio and has a successful, fun apparel brand based on positivity and kindness called freetobe.com. Jules is passionate about helping others to listen to life and get out of their own way. Meet Jules on julesprice.com. Here is the interview with Jules Price. In your own words, who is Jules Price? Oh, wow. Um, that's a, that's a good one to start with. Um, well, I, um, I think I'm a lot of things. I'm, I'm a singer and a Broadway performer in my past, um, an author of two books now and, um, a success coach and hopefully a a good friend and, and wife. Um, but I guess sort of my essence is I just care in everything that I do. I care about helping people reach their potential and kind of get out of their own way, all their obstacles and mindset that are preventing them from being where they want to be. That's my passion and kind of all the avenues of my life of what I do now, not letting people's mindset stand in the way of what they're looking for and what their, what their dreams are. I, uh, even, even my books, you know, are totally different topics. One's about business and one's about dating, but it's all about kind of arming people with verbiage and mindset that sets them up for success and, and, um, you know, kind of thinks to themselves, I can do this, which is, um, my favorite feedback is when people, you know, tap into that themselves and really see themselves being able to do something because of maybe the way I've positioned it. So I love that. Um, 
I'm an entrepreneur, always have been. And um, pretty much all my businesses are always centered around positivity and lifting people up, being thoughtful. I have a card and a gift business that's all about, um, you know, helping people share gratitude and appreciation, which I think is such a huge, important part of life right now, and especially now, and always has been, but um, helping people to kind of let them know that you appreciate them and you see them. Um, I love humor and just feel like the more you can help people laugh, the more they'll remember, the more something will stay with them. I am an avid workout person now, which I never was before I started working out. And now I love it because it really grounds me and balances me and helps me be my best self mentally and physically. And I guess overall, I just am passionate about helping people listen to life, I call it, and just um, react to the things that happen around them. And um, I just think the simplest gestures can go such a long way in today's crazy, crazy world. So before we talk about some of the topics in your book, specifically, don't eat the scraps and other powerful jewels, rules for success in any new relationship. I have these questions here. I guess the first one, because I really love this listen to life idea. I have to ask you this question. What is life to you, Jules? I think that in my life, it's always been about how can I add value? So like, I don't have kids, for instance. And I think that a lot of times when people have children, they develop that feeling of leaving a legacy, you know, and it kind of helps make life feel more meaningful or fulfilled when you feel like you're leaving something behind and it's not just all about you. And, you know, and that's the way I feel about kind of everything that I try to do, even though I don't have kids, I look for ways to add value, to, to have an impact, to have kind of, um, you know, an effect beyond your own arm arms reach so that people feel that effect, whether you're there or, or long after you're gone. And, um, I think that's all we can do in life is just, you know, look for ways to add value, look for ways to make that impact and feel like you're making a difference. What do you think is, what do you feel is the opposite to life? Well, I mean, obviously death comes to mind, but <laughs> right. sometimes I, I think that, um, I think the opposite to life is the people that, that can't get out of their own way. You know, they're always looking for the downside of things or why they can't do something. Um, I, I know in my profession, I've come across it so many times where people have kind of given up and um, their negative mindset is what's preventing them from everything. And it's really sad to me because then they're just kind of existing. So maybe the answer to the opposite of life is just treading water and existing and not um, trying to get past things. I mean, we all have major obstacles and some more than others. And um, I always try to reframe things and look for the positive or how how you can take steps forward always, always, and be resourceful to get in the direction that you want to go. And I think that we have the power to create our own happiness and to, you know, to really tap into what makes life special. And I think the opposite of life are the people that aren't able to do that. And so then they're just not able to find the things that make life fulfilling. What leads us to be stuck in this negative mindset? Do you have some ideas? Well, I think that, you know, 85% of what we're exposed to on a daily basis mm, right. is negative and the, the yeah. media and the, yeah. my yeah. goodness, the election, <laughs> and, you know, it's yeah. like everything <laughs> around us. And then sometimes we surround ourselves with people that are naysayers or that don't have our best interests at heart. They, they secretly feel threatened if we succeed. So they want to see us fail, you know, and then we're our own worst enemies at all times. I think, you know, the, the, our mind, what's between our ears is the number one thing that's going to make the difference of whether you succeed or whether you fail. And it's so hard. You know, I grew up, like I said, I was a Broadway performer. So my whole, all of my twenties and and half of my thirties, I was in a city, New York city, um, and surrounding myself with people that were going after their dreams. You know, you don't go to two auditions and give up, you know, you're, you're in line and you're in the five in the morning to wait in line for hours and hours to get into a room to sing for 15 seconds, you know, and then you do it all again the next day. So I think I really was in that position of almost being 
um, conditioned to learn to like have a vision and go after it and, and be, you know, growing your going after what you want, even if other people don't see it yet. But then when I moved out of New York and I, you know, was around people that were just, had kind of given up on what you know, the, they didn't like the jobs they were doing it and like the marriages they were in. And, and every, it was just a whole different mindset of a lot of people that are letting the negativity or their obstacles get them down. And, um, I think that's why I became so passionate really about, um, helping with the tools that I had just kind of naturally developed or, or, you know, over my own obstacles developed that helped me reframe and, and stay positive in a pretty negative world. You're trained to have a positive mindset. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing yeah. that, but when I really right. think back yeah. to, you know, being yeah. so young and moving to New York City and being in that world where we all just were, you know, doing our best to work at crazy jobs, to make enough money to be there. And, and, you know, like all the things that we went through to be able to build the life that we wanted. And, um, that takes a, it takes a lot to do that. So not only was I kind of conditioned through my daily life, but then, like I said, surrounding myself with people that were all doing that too, it really was a very special, um, you know, for, for a long, long time for that 14 years in, in that city. I love New York City, but it is a tough place to live. And it really made me the person that I am today. If life had one purpose, one purpose only, what would you say that is the purpose of the human experience? I mean, the word that comes to mind is connection. I think that I've just learned that finding those connections with people that you feel like you vibrate on the same level is everything. And, you know, I think that people that feel most lost are people that don't have that in their lives. Someone that grounds them, someone that fills their bucket, someone, you know, or multiple people that are like-minded. And I think that that is the number one thing in life, because it, when you have that connection and that grounding, then you never can fall. You know, it's just, there's always someone that's going to be there to help you when you're having your bad days. Wow. That inspires me to ask you two questions about friendship. What makes a true friend? And also, can we become our own best friend? For me, <laughs> friendship's always been interesting because I am an above and beyonder. You know, like I just have always like probably to the point where people don't even trust it. They're like, why is she doing all this for me? You know, but that's just, again, I just try to add value, look for ways to help other people. Um, you know, someone comes to my house and likes the lamp in my living room. I send them that lamp on Amazon, you know, like, like, it's like, I just am that person. Um, so that's the kind of friend that I am. And I think what I've had to learn, um, and really embrace is not to ever be that person that then is secretly expecting things back. You know, like to me, the, the key to friendship is to do the things, to add value, to, to be that person, but not ever develop expectations where you're suddenly disappointed or feeling empty because you're not receiving that level back that you're giving out. And I always have to ask myself, you know, and I think if you're a giver, then this is an important question to ask yourself is, am I doing this to give or am I doing this to get something? And you have to be very honest with yourself about that because if you're doing it to, to because you want a certain level of thanks, because you want a certain level of reciprocation, then you're actually not giving your it's, it's selfish, you know, and, and you have to really, really, um, catch yourself, I think. So can we be our own best friend? I think that that is, um, a whole other very important topic about how hard people are on themselves and we're our own worst enemies. We, um, compare ourselves to other people. Social media has made that very difficult where you look at someone else's life and just think, oh, Valeria, you know, oh, wow, I could never be like that. Or she has no problems because her life is perfect, you know, and um, that's so, so hard because we're faced with that every day. And it takes a strong character to not be down on yourself and not compare yourself. Um, and uh, I think someone once said, you know, social media is so tough because you're comparing your worst day with everyone else's best, <laughs> True. you know, and it's like every day, mm -hmm. you know how you feel and you see what they're putting forward. And I mean, it's, you're going to lose, you know, if that's the way you're looking at it. So anyway, um, I think 
being your own best friend is about giving yourself a break, always looking for ways to be better, not being so hard on yourself, not being down on yourself and developing. If you, if you're not, if you don't have a natural positive attitude, I am here to tell you, you can get better. Um, and because, you know, I, I'm a Virgo and I'm a, I'm kind of like a self-proclaimed pessimist from growing up because I always wanted to be prepared for the, what could go wrong, you know, but then I had to catch myself and make sure I wasn't being negative and really developed a positive attitude. And so I do believe that you can, if you want to, you can get better at that and catch yourself in those negative thoughts and turn it around and reframe and be resourceful and look for new ways to, um, get around an obstacle because otherwise you, you, if you're not your own best friend, then, um, you have a tough road ahead of you. I often ask the question about unconditional love, self-love. Now, do you believe in unconditional self-love? And most people do believe that, but they think it's uh, not a realistic goal. I mean, I guess I haven't thought too much about about that as far as um, the concept of self-love, except for what we just talked about, about not being negative and not comparing. Um, I do, I think it's just difficult to do, you know, and it sounds good. You can put sticky notes all over your house <laughs> yeah. about being positive and loving yourself. And, <laughs> but like so many people from, you know, the moment they wake up in the morning, they're just really down on, you know, who they are, what, what they do, um, what they look like, you know, and, um, self-love is a very difficult thing. But like I said, it's one of those things that you, you know, there's so much out there resources to tap into, to help you turn those thoughts around. And, um, the only way to really reach your own potential is if, um, you know, you're able to get better at that so that you can continue to grow as a person. Do you think we have a way of measuring that unconditional self-love or a good level of self-love? And if you do, what would that be? I think it's, you know, what you find coming out of your mouth every day. You know, Mm -hmm. if it's like saying like little disparaging comments about yourself or, you know, if you're putting yourself down to other people, you can catch yourself in that. Um, When my mom uh, lost my father 16 years ago, um, she was just in a really dark place and she just, everything that came out of her mouth was things like, well, I'll never be able to do this. And well, you know, and I had to really help her catch those negative phrases um, and things that she was so, so down about. And really, you know, it just took a long time for her to turn it around, but um, she was able to. And I, you know, I think we can catch ourselves, what we say to ourselves, either in our heads or out loud to other people and ask, you know, am I being kind to myself? What is love to you? What is your idea or definition of love? Wow. Um, I mean, it's, I was just thinking about that last week, actually, like it's such a, such a strange concept. Um, because there's, there's so many levels, as you know, I mean, there's friendship love that again, is that connection, those people that are your tribe that, you know, you, you aren't necessarily related, you know, it might not always be your family, um, but it's the people that leave you better than they found you and, and make you feel, you know, amazing. And the people that you surround yourself with, you know, that that's love. If it's the people that make you feel better about yourself when you're hanging up the phone or when you're walking away than, than when you saw them. People that when they call you on your cell and you have call, you know, uh, caller ID, that you smile the second you see the name, you know, because they add value. They make you feel good. Um, they're not just calling because they want something, you know. <laughs> That's love to me is the friendships and the, even the work relationships that, that add value. And even the, you know, like more superficial business connections of, of, you know, even like, like the way you and I are meeting today and having a like-minded conversation, even that that's love to me is, is, you know, making those kinds of connections as far as, uh, love, romantic love, you know, um, my book that we'll talk about with Don't Eat the Scraps is such a fun, fun topic for me because I, you know, although I've always been helping people with their relationships, it's always been more business relationships or relationship with self. And so this book has been such a fun departure into romantic relationships and my advice in that area. Um, but even that came out of, I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, because I had these personal experiences and created this funny way to 
to frame it and to explain it that really seemed to help people. And that the whole reason I wrote the book is because it's, it wasn't like, I'm like, I'm going to write a book about relationships. Um, but even that love to me is about, um, people that make your soul better people that you, um, you know, that make your life better and you look forward to seeing them. You look forward to talking to them. Um, and you know, you are of the mindset where you're in a place where you can truly love. You know, I think that that's the hardest part for a lot of people is that they don't love themselves. So it makes their relationships, their romantic relationships with other people very difficult. Because like I talk about in my book, there's just a balance of power that gets really off when you don't have that strong love for yourself and your sort of non-negotiables set. Then it's very hard to have a true healthy love relationship with someone else. Do you practice any form of, let's say, yeah, spirituality? But before that, what is your idea of spirituality apart from religion? I think to me, spirituality has always been more about mindset and about connection to, you know, to the earth in some ways, you know, I love taking my shoes off and being (laughs) in the grass or on the beach. I live in Florida and just having that kind of true connection to the earth and nature. I think that spirituality is about the connection that you have with people and the people that lift you up and the people that you lift up. And then, yeah, I think, I think to me, the biggest thing about it is energy and it's the energy that you send out into the world. It's the energy that you receive back. And it's the, it's the crazy energy that makes that person that you haven't thought of in years and you just thought of them, they call and, you know, half an hour later and you're like, what is that? That's me. <laughs> that's energy. That's spirituality. That's, that's what makes life just amazing is that, um, that energy that seems to, you know, be on your, on your brain waves, on your, on your, in your heart and in, in your soul. Uh, that's spirituality to me. With all the challenges that we have faced and have still facing at this time, what do you think is the world's greatest need? And also, do you have a vision for a new reality? Oh, wow. (laughs) These are very, very deep, like you said. I love it. Oh my goodness. I mean, it's a lot of what we've already talked about. I think positivity, what the world needs a lot more of right now is positivity. (laughs) Um, People that their go-to is about how can we make this better? How can we fix this? Not like what's wrong and what can we complain about? And I am no saint. I am certainly someone that like sometimes feels like complaining about something. And then it's like, well, that's not going to get me anywhere. What can I do to help? What can I do to fix this? What can I do to look at this in another way? And I think that, you know, right now things are so heightened uh, more than ever before with COVID and with the election and with, you know, Black Lives Matter. And like, I mean, it's just, I've never known the world to be so charged and people to be so angry. And it's scary. It really is scary. I don't know, you know, what the world holds for us in the next, I don't even know, year or five years, because everyone is so mad and there's so much hate. Um, And so, yeah, the world needs positivity. The world needs more love. The world needs trying to see other people's point of view a little better and not being so closed off, not being right about everything. Um, And I think that, you know, we just need to listen more and, you know, listen to life. But like, really, if someone has an opposing view to you, you're only going to be a better person by listening and trying to understand it. Um, It's always going to make you better. And I just don't think we have enough of that right now. What do you see for the future after these challenges? I don't know if I have an answer to that. Um, I think I'm hopeful that, you know, I think that life goes through so many different phases and we're in a challenging one, certainly right now. And I think that that with that, in getting through it is going to be another period of light and another period of, you know, um, a shift and, and kindness and all the stuff that, you know, we'll kind of get through this and, and get to that lighter period where we look back on this and think, oh my goodness, remember 2020, you know, 
<laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know what the world has in store, but the good news is because I am a positive person, I don't see gloom and doom. I see that this is going to make us all stronger. I see that, you know, the, the virus will be behind us, you know, who knows how long, but um, I see that we're all going to emerge as, as you know, changed people from this. Even the quarantining is changing people forever. The way we interact as people, the, you know, the things we've always done just because we always do it, you know, the charity events, the, the, this, the, that, like all of a sudden we're all being stopped in our tracks from our patterns and our behavior. And that could be bad, but it also has the potential to be good. It has the potential to be powerful if we embrace that. And if we see what we can learn from it and what we, how we can move forward in a better way. I love this positivity. Uh, you really come across uh, the energy. Uh, your energy is really beautiful. Thank you for being in that force. <laughs> <laughs> and, and speaking of patterns, that's a word that's in your book about human uh, relationship patterns, especially male psych, understanding human behavior. So talk to me for a moment about the inspiration and also the intention of writing your book, Don't Eat the Scraps. Well, so this book was, like I kind of mentioned, it really came out of my own experiences dating in New York City. Um, it's where I met my husband 16 years ago. And um and the crazy thing is that um, basically the book describes a, a pattern of behavior that happens in the first six to eight weeks of dating that men, this is stereotypical, but men do that they don't know that they do. And and it creates an imbalance. It creates a um, disparity in the way the relationship is going. And six to eight weeks in, they break up with the woman and she's like, I don't know what happened. Everything was going great. So this is the pattern that I explore in the book that I talk about why this happens. And um, and it's funny, hopefully. It's a it's a humorous book. And the way I explain everything is funny. Even the, the, um, the theory, don't eat the scraps. It's a funny thing. It's not a you know, date, uh, diet book, <laughs> it's not about eating, you know, but it's a, it's a funny thing of like the scraps that they're flinging your way. You keep your mouth closed. You don't eat them, etc. So this whole book was because these, uh, my husband, when we were dating, he broke up with me six weeks in and the guy before him broke up with me six weeks in with almost an identical speech that was like, I don't love you. And I never will. I'm like, what love? Like who said anything about <laughs> six weeks? So I, I just started thinking there's gotta be something here. And I developed this theory. And what's so cool is, like I said, that was 16 years ago. So for all these years, I developed the theory called donate the scraps. I've been telling people about it. And Every time I do, you know, I'll, I'll be at a dinner party or, you know, somewhere where someone's like, I don't know what happened. Things were going so great. I'm like, I do. And I start telling them about my theory and their, their jaws are on the ground. Their brain, you know, is racing and everybody's like, you've got to tell people about this. Like this makes so much sense. So it really, you know, I started writing it, um, probably about 10 years ago and then put it away and then wrote a little more and put it away and wrote a little more and put it away. And so by the time I finally published it in 2019, it had, I'd been writing it for 10 years. And that's, what's so fun about it because it covers the stories of these women that all the way from the day I told them about this theory to now when they're married with kids and they, they all say, you know, it's because of this, that I believe I'm in this happy relationship today. So it's been so much fun. And that's why I wrote it because I thought, okay, I have all these years of women saying, you've got to write this down. And I finally did. And I don't know how much you wanted to disclose uh, the theory, but that's my next question. Talk to me about the don't eat the scraps theory. Okay. Yeah. So I always joke around when people say, well, what is it? And I'm like, you have to read the book. Right. I right. really want people to read it. You know, it's, right. it's the actual reading of the book, the, you know, hour and a half or two hours it takes you to read it. It's pretty short. And the, the, the font is big. People thank me for the big font. Um, and there's pictures, but, um, the actual experience of reading it is meant to feel like watching a fun movie. You know, it really is like a sex in the city episode or a movie. And by the time you finish reading it, you've kind of had this experience and you have this great smile on your face. So that's why I say, you know, I'm not going to tell you the theory. You got to read the book, but, um, because I want people to have that experience of reading as I lay it all out. But the general gist of it, like I said, is that men do something um, 
pretty specific in the first six to eight weeks of dating and they don't mean to do it. It's not, this is not a male bashing book in any way. Um, I, uh, one of my friends explained it as, um, my male friend said, I kind of lovingly lay out both sides. You know, there's no judgment. There's no men do this or that. And because of that, it's just, it's just, um, shedding a light on a pattern of behavior that happens. And the women, women tend to interpret this behavior in a certain way that causes the balance of the relationship to get really off. And that causes him to break up with her. And then she's really left feeling like she doesn't know what happens. So the joke of the book on the front that says for women only is because we don't want men to read this book. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> yeah, right. we don't want them to change. We're not trying to change them or else they could all read it and, and do differently. But it's like, um, we just want women to know that this happens so that they're more aware of it so that they feel empowered. You know, the fun thing is I have people calling me up saying this happened and this happened, but I didn't eat the scraps, you know, and and they, they, they are able to kind of recognize it and combat it so that it just gives the relationship a better shot to make it through that kind of crucial dating period of, you know, two months in, once you get over the hump, you know, it's not like you have to do this forever, but once you're kind of aware that this occurs, it, it gives women this vocabulary surrounding it. And um, it's crazy how many times people have said to me, oh my gosh, you know, on my second date, he said, I can see forever with you, you know, or whatever. And um, you'll see, you'll read more about what the scraps are. But if you just learn that it's not, um, you know, the scraps are not meant for consumption. You're not <laughs> supposed to eat them. You're just supposed to realize that it's a scrap. And uh, it really helps women kind of get their footing more because they're empowered to understand the balance of that relationship a little bit better and they're able to move through it. So the sense of humor component, why did you choose to use that? Well, I I think part of it is my personality. I've always been kind of quippy and funny. And I really think that that is the beauty in, in life when you're able to see humor in things. Then you never take yourself too seriously. You never, you know, get too down on a situation. And as far as knowledge and learning, I think people always learn better when they laugh. And Mm -hmm. that's one of the really cool things about both the books I've written. My first book was about business, but it's very funny. And people would call me up and say, you know, they'll tell me something that they remembered from the book and it's because it made them laugh. Um, And when you think about all the things in life that you remember most, a lot of it is because you have that really you know, you laughed until you cried. Um, so I really think that, um, humor is so important. It helps people remember things. I also develop little things I call my magic sentences or phrases, um, or Jules rules in this book. Um, but, but when you give people a vocabulary and you give them phrases, you know, they're going to use them because they have it to draw on uh, for a rainy day. You know, they're able to call me up and say, oh, this happened and this happened, but then I did this because it's something that made them laugh, but then they remembered it, um, that magic phrase. Talk to me also for a moment about the illustrations. I love them. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. So I, I've been so lucky. Both my books I had illustrated from two different people, but just um, I kind of went with a little bit the way you uh, go about things that you've explained where you kind of lead with your heart. Um, I found this illustrator who lives in Indonesia on uh, that website, Fiverr, you know, um, and I interviewed a couple people. I wanted to find a woman that was um, excited about illustrating a book that she hadn't even read, you know, and that's hard to find. (laughs) You know, a lot of people are just, they're there to do the work. And I wanted to find someone that was just kind of understood my vibrations of what I wanted to convey. And I wanted the illustrations to be beautiful and colorful and fun and make someone feel the rule that it's illustrating. So each, each one of the illustrations is one of Jules, Jules rules. Um, and I, uh, I had her illustrate it without reading the book. And that happened in both my books. It's very unusual that the illustrator didn't read the book, <laughs> but it's because I, I wanted them to create something without a lot of, you know, without too much in their head. Like I wanted them to know what I wanted to convey and then see what they come up with. And her drawings were just absolutely amazing. And we had this great back and forth too, where I could tell she was excited about the work because I would say kind of what I wanted. And then she would write back and say, Oh, and what if we did this? You know? And I'm like, yes, I love that. Even like the cover of the book, um, 
it has this awesome girl uh, holding an umbrella and with the scraps, these like giant like potato looking scraps flying at them <laughs> and blocking it with an umbrella. And the cool thing was I initially explained what I wanted and she came back with this drawing and I said, oh, I love it, but you can't see her face. Like you can't see that she's, her mouth is closed and she's not eating the scraps. I'm like, you just see the umbrella. And I asked her to do another one and she did another one. And I thought, no, you know what? I love that first one. I, I just fell in love with the one where you just can't even see her face. <laughs> she's just blocking the scraps with her umbrella. So anyway, we just had, we had such a fun back and forth where she came up with ideas that I loved and, and vice versa. And um, yeah, I think they really add to the book. Definitely. I love the visual, especially when it's fun and innocent in a way. I, I, I'm attracted to that too, for some reason. Well, it's cool that you say that because I've actually <laughs> had a lot of people have their daughters read my book. <laughs> yeah. And that to me is one of the biggest compliments. Like if you read a book and you think, I want my 13 year old to read this, or I want my 15 year old to read this, it proves to me that number one, there's nothing R rated in this book at all. And number two, it teaches concepts and principles that they want their daughters to learn. That is very special to me. And, um, one of the girls in the book that, um, that I helped with her relationships and she ended up marrying this guy. And by the time I got back to her to let her know that the book was coming out, she was pregnant and she had just found out that she was pregnant with a girl. And she's like, I'm going to have my daughter read this. And I, was just, I was just like so special that it's, it is, it's innocent and it's, it's pure and there's nothing in it that's, you know, PG 13. Why and how you became a singer? Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, I think that's one of those things that kind of chooses you. You know, oh, yeah. I grew up like always singing. I was five years old and announced I wanted to be an opera singer, you know, and then just sort of saying all my life, you know, I was in shows. I knew when I went to college that I wanted to move to New York to be a performer, even though I was actually a psychology major with music, both. But, um, you know, I, I graduated with my psychology degree and my professors all thought I was going to become a psychologist. And I'm like, I'm going to New York to do Broadway, you know? So I think I've just always been in love with, with performing on stage. And again, it's so interesting because for me, performing has never been about like, look at me. It's always about the experience that I feel like, you know, when I was Maria in the Sound of Music on the Broadway tour, like I wanted every night for the audience to have an experience and, and be on a journey. And so that I felt like at the end, I, the, you know, I made their lives better in some way. And to me, that's always what performing has been to me. You say that for most part, men and women do think, feel and operate differently. So my question is, how different really are we men and women? Well, anyone that's married will be able to weigh in on that one. <laughs> We're pretty different, um, which is a beautiful thing. You know, again, like the last thing we need in life is to surround ourselves with people who are just like us. You know, it's like you learn more and, and you're better when you when you're challenged and when you, you know, you come across someone that thinks completely differently than you and you're like, how did they think that? And then you you try to find the common ground and understand, have an understanding more. But um yeah, I mean, you know, the book describes the stereotypical. I say that because, of course, there's always the case where someone would read it and go, well, Humphrey wasn't like that at all, you know. Um, and, you know, it's a stereotypical pattern of men and women and what that, you know, that kind of stereotype might involve. But I do think that we, you know, we're just different beings. And men sometimes are a lot more black and white. And in this instance, with the scraps that they're throwing, you know, there's no negative intentions with it. They're not trying to manipulate women. Um, they're really just doing it because to them, it just feels good. And they're trying on a coat to see how it feels. And, um, you know, but unfortunately, women who are, are more conditioned to look for clues and, and, you know, they're more cautious at first and they're kind of letting their defenses down slower and slower and slower and slower. Unfortunately, they're reading those scraps as clues and, you know, and it's just creating a mixed message. So with men, men and women just operate differently. They're, you know, not necessarily 
one is bad. It's just absolutely about communication, about connection and finding that common footing so that the energies are the same, that you're on that same page and you have that balance. Um, and you know, a lot of times it's a little bit of a dance, especially in the beginning of a relationship. Also, another thing that you said in your book that caught my attention is the difference between compromising within a relationship and compromising ourselves. Talk to me about these two different aspects. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really deep concept that, um, it's funny. I had a friend that read the book and, and that was the part that she highlighted and sent back to me. And she said, this could be like a whole book in itself. And it's true because I only just kind of touch on it, but I think that, you know, it's absolutely essential that we're in relationships where we compromise, you know, it's very, very important to, make compromises on pick your battles mm, right. <laughs> you know? and there are certain things to stand your ground on and there's other things to say you know what I'm going to really listen and see someone else's point of view and and you know maybe let this or this you know occur instead but unfortunately there's a tendency for a lot of people in general but women let's say to compromise too much to compromise themselves. And that's where you have to just look for that balance. And, um, you know, I talk a little bit in my first book about, um, just how some people, some women are, you know, they, they're either too much give they're get too, what, how do you express it? Like give too much so that they give them, they give themselves away, you know, instead of being a giver again, because it feels good to give and they're just giving and giving and giving to get, um, there's a lot of women that, you know, don't stand their ground. And so they're compromising themselves by not standing up for what they believe in, for always giving in to someone else, um, putting themselves last, maybe if they have kids and they're putting everybody in the whole family before them. Um, so it's just a concept to think about, like, am I compromising because I, you know, am picking my battles and I'm standing my ground on other things, or am I compromising, myself and agreeing to something that really and truly isn't making me happy. So it's important to feel the difference. Yeah. Right, I think Jules. that's the only way yeah. to do it because there's just so many different scenarios of, you know, uh, of when you're dealing with other people, there things are going to get hard. And, and, you know, whether it's friendships or whether it's romantic relationships, there's a lot of compromise that goes on. And I think that, you know, deep, deep down in your stomach, like whether you're just giving up or whether you're, you know, whether you have strength in making a decision to go a different way. Online dating. So you talk about that, of course. And so I guess my main question uh, for you today is, do you recommend online dating these days? Well, so I did meet my husband on Match.com in New York City, um, and I've always been a big fan of online dating. And the reason is because you're not going to stop meeting people in your regular life too. You know, that you still get that. You still <laughs> might meet someone in a bar. Well, no, I don't know about bars these days, but you know, you, you're going to run into someone on the subway or you're going to meet someone in a restaurant or a mutual friend that you still have that. But online dating just increases your chances. You know, I never would have met my husband. He was a chef in New York and only went to the East Village. And I was an actress in New York and Midtown and never went down below 14th Street. You know, we literally wouldn't have met. And so, you know, obviously New York is a is a different kind of market, but um, it's just increasing your opportunity. And more importantly, I think there's a really big mindset thing of you're not just waiting for life to happen to you, but you are taking control and saying, you know, I I'm putting my intentions out there and I'm looking for someone that, that I connect with. And I think there's a real beauty in that, in the strength in that, and not just saying, oh, well, we'll see if it happens. Let's just see. Well, if we wait patiently and happily and peacefully, then I guess it's okay. But most of the time, we that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. We become unhappy and uneasy <laughs> and everything else in between. <laughs> yeah, and you feel like you missed the boat because, you know, right. this or this didn't happen versus, you know, you're just maximizing your chances. And, you know, listen, online dating is just... It, for the most part, once you meet someone, you know, from day one, it's 
then it becomes like meeting someone in regular life anyway, you know, because you still have that, the real interaction, you still are going to have to have conversations and, you know, and go through the scrap period and, you know, and all of that. But it's just maximizing like who you're meeting. Um, You already know a little bit about them. Hopefully that's, you know, creating some possible um, connection and and common ground. And, um, and like I said, it's just giving you a little bit, if you're, Female, certainly, I think it gives you a little bit of um, that empowerment feeling of, you know, I'm not just sitting back and, and waiting for something to happen. You say never settle for good enough. That's one message. Never stop seeing the humor in life. That's wonderful. Self-love, gratitude, resilience, empowerment, doing what you believe in. And another thing that you wrote here, that I wrote here, that was in your book that I really like, you say... I think I'm paraphrasing. We can blame other people's actions all day long, but if we have a negative attitude in life, we will not ever find the happiness we seek. So true. That's a big one. And, you know, like so many times, like I said, it's really easy to fall into negative patterns. And especially like maybe it as far as love life, if you're not happy in your love life, and it's really easy to just kind of spiral a little bit. But the fact is that with all the things I talk about, all of Jules' rules, even if you're not eating the scraps and you're you're doing everything right, if your mindset is not right, that's why I have a whole chapter about it, um, then nothing is going to come your way. And I've just learned that about, you know, from everything that I've ever done, from my performing career to my my greeting card business to my you know, I have a fun clothing line now. And like everything is about mindset because if you cannot get past yourself, then, you know, you can't allow beautiful things to come in. There's one thing, we're almost at the end. So I have final questions for you here, some of them, but there's something that caught my attention too, in a, I guess, in a funny way, Jules online rules. And you have one that says, never meet them for a meal. <laughs> so I'm like, what is this about? Oh That's yes. unique. <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, again, everything on my book is from literally experience, right? So I had all these women friends in Manhattan that would do online dating to get a free dinner. <laughs> and wow. I'm like, well, first of all, that is ridiculous, you know, like, because, mm. but my, my advice of never meeting them for a meal is that then you're stuck. You know, if you meet someone from hello, you want to run and then you have to sit down and have dinner with them. That is a nightmare. So (laughs) (laughs) my advice, you know, always for that rule is about like, just meet them for a drink um, or, you know, coffee. So it's, it's a finite amount of time. I also talk about always having um, another, you know, friend engagement two hours later. So let's say you meet someone for a drink at seven and you tell them ahead of time, Hey, by the way, I'm meeting my friend at nine, you know, so that you always have that out. And then also more importantly, maybe you have kind of a crappy date and instead of going home and feeling sorry for yourself, then you really do meet that friend at nine. So you ha- you can always have someone to laugh with. And if, even if you really like that guy at seven, you know, like, Hey, leave him wanting more by going to meet your friend anyway, you know, don't you dare cancel. So, um, yeah, that, but meeting, I never understood the women that wanted to, <laughs> just to have a free dinner. I'm like, come on, that is not what this is all about. And, you know, if you, if you have those if you're meeting someone for a meal, like I said, oh, I learned the hard way. You are definitely sitting down and having a long period of time where you have to make conversation with someone that probably you should have just had coffee with. I have a few more questions for you, Jules. Before I ask them, would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? Oh, my goodness. Um, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't think my book is next to me, but... Um, I don't know. I think that, um, I mean, I love the passages that you read, uh, already. And, um, I guess I would just like to say that if, if anyone listening to this, you know, wants to read it, I think that you'll just have an experience. You know, it's not just for people that are looking for love. I've had so many married friends read it and laughed all the way through and felt like they watched a great movie. And, you know, also everyone that even if you're already married, you already know a lot of single people that probably need this as well. So it's just fun to be able to read it and have this, you know, knowledge and and fun, um, fun things that I talk about. And then I also, Valeria, I don't know if you read the, um, glossary, but I would, yeah. yeah. uh, 
if you do read the book, make sure you read the glossary at the end because I created this uh, vocabulary of words like, you know, scrapalicious, <laughs> yeah, uh, scrapatino, so and, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. scrap valley. But, um, you know, and I defined everything in a funny way. But, but what's cool about that is it does create this kind of um, language that, um, it just empowers people. And, and it's all, it's all kind of part of the fun theory, but, um, I've had a couple people that tell me that they didn't read it because it's almost like maybe it reminds them of a textbook and, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, I don't need to read that part at the end, but it's definitely part of the book. <laughs> I would say, um, yes, if you're going to read it, I hope you enjoy it and love it and, uh, give it to, people as a gift if they're looking for a relationship or even if they're not and definitely enjoy the glossary too. Success. How do you define success? What's to be successful to you? I mean, that's such a tricky one because I think that my personality, like I always, I was the girl that like had to get an A plus, um, you know, had to be an overachiever had to, you know, to me for a long time, that was success. If I'm getting my A plus, I'm getting my check mark, I'm getting my approval. Um, and that was just who I was. And I think I've really had to, uh, I'm not cured by any means, but I think I really (laughs) had to find that balance of like having success be more from within and, you know, not, not looking for that external, my, my trainer would disagree because when I'm in class, I'm always looking Mm -hmm. for him to say, good Jules, good Jules. <laughs> but you know, it's like, you know, you learn as an adult that the more your success comes from within and your affirmations come from within, the less you need from external factors, then the happier you'll be. And so um, I think that success to me is the impact that you make on others, the, um, the positivity that you spread. If you're that person that calls and they look down at their phone and they want to pick it up, then you're doing something right. Um, that's success to me. It's not about money. It's about impact. It's about influence. It's about um, contribution and connection. And um, I think that, you know, that's what we're all looking for is to feel fulfilled in those areas. And that's success. What was the hardest or the most challenging lesson you have learned about yourself? Well, challenging lesson. I mean, I think life is a challenging lesson. You know, like I, if I look back, you know, I'm 48, um, although I think I look 32. (laughs) (laughs) um, (laughs) I have on a Zoom call today say I look 32. So anyway, um, you know, life is hard. I think one of the things that I've learned most is that even when you are that person that's trying to be, you know, more positive, that's trying to do all the things we've talked about today, then there's still other people that are just always trying to drag you down because that's where they are. And, you know, and it's hard to kind of stand in positivity when there's other people that are, um, that are seeing things differently. Maybe you have a spouse that's not as positive as you. Um, that's hard. I, I, I know a lot of people in that situation. And so, it's not even like a specific challenge in life as much as like, I just know that it is hard to keep being the person that keeps getting up. And, um, that's the person that I want to be. I want to be that light to other people to help them do that. And I want to always look for ways that I can be better, that I can learn, that I can, um, you know, I have my, all my faults and then just try to have less and less of them every day because you're just always trying to be a better person and overcome that despite all the things that are, you know, maybe trying to drag you in another direction. It is a challenge to be positive and uplifting all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then people, you know, the, then they hold that against you. They mm, think, oh, yeah. she's, so happy. she's got no problem. <laughs> you know, That's it's true. like, uh, so I'll just share <laughs> real quick. Like I, um, I, uh, five years ago or six years ago, I was diagnosed with MS with multiple sclerosis. And, um, that was a real setback in my life. I'd never, I don't even have a cavity, you know, and suddenly I have this, I lost vision in my left eye and went through all this stuff. So I won't go into it, but, but what's interesting is I didn't really tell anyone. Right. So I just kept on being positive in my business, grow, you know, teaching my coaching clients, uh, building everything. And I just didn't really talk about it because to me, I was, I thought this isn't going to define me and I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to, even though I couldn't see out of my left eye, I'm like, this isn't going to stop me. So anyway, ended up, um, this year in, in March. So six years later, 
I finally did a post about it on Facebook of all things. And I, I just kind of wrote about my journey and wrote about my challenges and what had happened of losing my vision and finding out I had MS and then having these lesions that are affecting anyway. Um, and and then my spin on it of like how I'm like, well, you know, all we have is this, this, and this, and all we have is to be positive. And anyway, by sharing this post, it was crazy because everybody in my life apparently thought my life was perfect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. The response that I got was overwhelming of people, you know, I had like over 700 comments and, and, you know, people sharing it and people crying and writing to me. And I thought, okay, you know, clearly I need to do this more, but we all, you know, we all make judgments about other people that their lives are perfect. And we have to try to understand that everybody is dealing with the, you know, good and bad and whatever foot they put forward, whether it's a positive foot or not, does not mean that they don't have the same problems as you. Um, and it was just, it was, it was an interesting experience for me, um, to, kind of be moved to share that for the first time in six years. And then what came back from it was, was really interesting of how many people really did just think my life didn't have any challenges in it. So it's interesting stuff. And yeah, I admire your resilience and the courage to be vulnerable because that's also part of being strong. Yeah, it's so true. It's hard to do, but it's really meaningful because I think that people, you know, they connect to your vulnerability as much as they connect to your positivity. If you knew you would die soon, meaning losing the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything in a different way? I would definitely eat more cake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, that is a, an interesting one. <laughs> A delicious one. I'm only five feet tall and I'm always trying to you know, be fit. So I would just eat some cake. No, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think that luckily I can say that I, I try to live my life every day as if, you know, as if that is the case, because I think we've only got one shot and, uh, I'm probably haven't always been that person, but I'd say for the last, you know, 10, 12 years, I've, I've really just embraced trying to be my best me, trying to um, do what I can for others, trying to be, you know, philanthropic, trying to um, just be the person that I can be proud of. And um, so I wouldn't say there's anything, you know, that comes to mind that I would do differently other than eating more delicious things. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Except for just that I think it is a beautiful idea to to think that life is finite and not to be scared of that or worried about that, but to think like, am I doing the things today that I want to do and need to do to, to, you know, live life to the fullest. And my last question is what are three things about life, you know, for sure, as of now, number one, you know, (laughs) <laughs> life is night. And, you know, I wish, it, I wish that we'd all live forever, although that would be complicated too. Um, <laughs> right. but so you, you know, you do need to think about like, am I taking steps in the right direction? And am I, um, am I better today than yesterday? And, um, if not, what can I do to change that? So, um, that's number one. Um, uh, what else? Um, how, how did you express it again? What are the three things that what? Yeah. What are three things about life, you know, for sure as of today? Yeah, I would say the second thing is that I know for sure that our relationships that we're in, whether it's business, whether it's personal friendships or love, um, make us better people. So surround yourself with the people that are going to, you know, make you better and, and that you can contribute to. Um, I know for a fact that that is what makes life worth it. And the people that just don't have the ability to connect with others are missing out. Um, and I guess, uh, what else do I know for sure? I know for sure that men throw scraps. <laughs> <laughs> That's, of course. Yeah. That has to be one of them. Yeah, that is why I wrote the book. Um, you know, it's like, it's kind of fun, but, uh, you know, obviously like these kinds of things do exist. You know, the, the more you can just learn about it, the more you can laugh about it, the better. Thank you so much, Jules, for this fun, meaningful, beautiful conversation. I love how genuine you are. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I've loved your questions like, 
Wow, those were those were some toughies. No wonder you don't send them to people ahead of time. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh my right. goodness! But thank you for challenging my brain and my heart, and um, thank you for all that you do. Yeah, thank you. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Ah, thank you for asking. Um, so if you go to my website, jewelsprice.com, so that's J-U-L-E-S-P-R-I-C-E.com, um, that links to um, both of my books. Uh, again, the dating book that we talked about is the Don't Eat the Scraps. Um, uh, it has some of my songs on it, uh, which is kind of random because I don't have a lot of recordings, but I have a couple of songs on there. If anyone, usually when people hear I'm a singer, they're like, where can we hear you? And also... Um, yeah, it talks a little bit about the, the the card business that I do. Everything's on there. So that's probably the best resource. Um, if you're an Amazon Prime lover, then you can find my book on Amazon and get two-day shipping um, or free, you know, free shipping. Um, so I have both the paperback and the Kindle version. I don't have the audio yet. Some people have asked me about the audio book and I will be doing that. Um, but not yet. But right now, um, I think you'll, even people that don't love to read, have told me that they've just flew through the book. So that's really nice to know that it's, you know, you're not like sitting down with a textbook. It's definitely going to be like a fun friend for two hours. And then, um, and yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy it. So thank you for asking. Thank you again, Jules. And we'll talk soon for sure. (laughs) Thank you so, so much. It's been a pleasure. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Jules Price and her work, please visit JulesPrice.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.